Good morning. Good morning. Oh, gee, we're going to do this again, eh? It's Friday, last day of the week. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Was everybody out late last night? I was getting texts from my superintendent at 3.45 this morning telling me, make sure I pronounce people's names properly. Believe that? 3.45. Man has no life. Michael St. John's is that superintendent. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering. Good morning and welcome back to day two of the International Concussion Summit Preventing Diagnosis and Treatment. Treatment. Yesterday was a great day with Nick Kiprios, the Rowan Law Panel, as well as Dr. Cantu. We had a lot of fun and it was an exciting day. The summit is made possible thanks to the vision of DSBN Director of Education, Warren Hashisaki, Dr. Blaine Hashisaki, and the hard work of the ICS team, Colleen Fast, which worked tirelessly, not effortlessly, <laughs> as stated yesterday. As many people corrected me, as like there's a bunch of grammar police <laughs> suddenly in the audience watching every word I say, <laughs> the ones you can understand. I listened to myself on YouTube. There was entire sentences I didn't even understand myself. <laughs> I said, what the hell did I just say? No idea. So I feel sorry for you people. But now it's up to you. I want to thank the 400 people that were here. Just give yourself a round of applause. Because you're going to carry the ball. You're going to go back to school on Monday. You're going to have to teach math, science, English, tech in the a gamut of courses that we have. You're going to have to be mentors and coaches. You're going to have to watch for cell phones, the dreaded vaping, the bullying, and now you're responsible for concussions. So you've got a big load to carry. So I applaud you for coming here. I applaud you for taking part in this. And I applaud all your health workers and education workers together for coming together for this. So thank you all very much. Because you'll be the one next week or the week after on bended knee looking in the children's eyes to see whether he can play or not play the sport. And sometimes the, the winning goal, the winning score will be on the line. And we all know you'll make the best decision <laughs> for kids because you always do. So to the teachers in the room, thank you very much. Applaud yourselves. You did a great job, and thank you for coming. The summit is being uh, live streamed. For those who could not attend, the link can be found on our ICF webpage. I'd now like to call forward to the podium parliamentary assistant, Sam Osteroff. Say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here today for this important summit. I'm delighted to be here with you at the seventh annual International Concussion Summit and deliver greetings on behalf of the Honorable Stephen Lecce, the Minister of Education. He wishes to extend his thanks to each and every one of you for the work you do and his regrets at not being able to be here, but he does hope to attend in future years. It's wonderful to see that this summit is so well attended by such a broad and engaged audience of teachers, coaches, athletes, and parents, as well as internationally recognized concussion experts and medical professionals, including members of the Rowan's Law Concussion Working Group. Every day we're learning more and more about the serious impact of concussions on human health. And we know through research that a concussion can have significant impact on athletes, including students cognitively, physically, emotionally, and socially. Our government is committed to help ensure the concussion safety of our young amateur athletes, especially students, so that they can lead safe and healthy lives on the field and at school. The seriousness of concussions is not just a problem for professional athletes 
in the Canadian Football League or the National Hockey League. This is happening in our schools, right here at home, in our rinks, and on our fields. It's why Ontario has worked, and each and every one of you have worked, to become leaders in the area of concussion management for our students. Ontario is a national leader in concussion awareness, prevention, and det detection, as well as management. I'm proud to say that Ontario was the first province to have a policy for school boards since 2015 to help students who've suffered a concussion to safely return to the classroom. But a policy is only one step in solving this problem. Recently, our government also introduced new mandatory learning about concussion awareness and management in the updated elementary health and physical education curriculum. It's now being taught as soon as kindergarten and in every grade through to grade eight. And through legislation, we are protecting our students even further. I'm pleased to say that I was able to vote for Rowan's law when it passed into law in March of 2018. I was very proud to do that. I want to congratulate Gordon and Kathleen Stringer for their advocacy, and for the courage it took to come forward. And I also want to acknowledge uh, my friend and colleague, uh, the Minister of Heritage, Tourism, Sp Sport, and Cultural Industries, and all the many people who worked so hard across the province, and I'm sure many of you as well, to make sure that Rowan's Law could come to be. In addition to the release of the updated concussion policy, the Ministry of Education has worked with the Ontario Physical and Health Education Association to develop, to develop resources such as sample code of conduct templates and a concussion protocol to help school boards with implementation of concussion policy. We are also working with the Ontario Physical Health Education Association on the development of new online learning modules for students and school staff on concussion safety. We know that in order to keep our students safe and healthy, it will require the collective efforts of everyone in this room, as well as many others. From educators, parents, coaches, health professionals, and other partners, we all have a task to do. Together we can work to further increase concussion awareness and enhance concussion prevention, detection, and management with the aim of continuing to keep our young people safe and healthy. I want to thank you again on behalf of the Minister of Education for your ongoing leadership in the area of concussion research, awareness, prevention, and management. I encourage you to continue to share ideas and collaborate so that we can all do our part to ensure students can surf, safely learn, succeed, and reach their potential. I want to thank you again for being here today and for all the important work you do each and every day, not only in this area, but in so many other areas. And I want to wish you all the best for the rest of your conference. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Miigwech. Thank you, Sam. Our first keynote speaker for today is Dr. Joya. If you're here a few years ago, Dr. Joya was with us. Dr. Joya, the Division Chief of Pediatrics. Just before I start that, Dr. Joya, just rewind that for a minute. I just got a hand signal off to the left. I'd like to invite Colleen Fast to the stage. <laughs> So before we officially start today, uh, we, are, we begin by this gathering by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties as, and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendships of Indigenous people. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Now, back to Dr. Joya, where we left off. First keynote speaker today is Dr. Joya. Dr. Joya, the Division Chief of Pediatrics. Neuropsychology at Children National Health Systems, where he directs the SCORE concussion program. He has developed a number of post-concussion tools for children and worked with CDC on their Heads Up Concussion Educational Toolkits. Dr. Joyce has 
participated in international concussions in sports group consensus meetings, American Academy of Neurology Sports, Concussion Guidelines Panel, and CDC Mild TBI Guideline Development. He provides concussion management service for youth, high school students, high schools, colleges, professional teams. He is currently president and fellow of Sports Neuropsychology Society. Please join and welcome back to the stage, Dr. Joya. Well, thank you very much, Ken. And I must say that um, it's always a pleasure to be back here. Let's see, let me think of how, let's see, with Blaine and his better looking brother Tom. And I said, okay, well, I, I'm going to hold off on any of those kind of things. Um, but um, so it, it really is truly a pleasure to be back. And, and when Roy had invited me, they asked, what would you like to speak on? And so in my typical way, I said, I don't know, what do you want me to speak on? Um, and we gave some options. They threw out, you know, me talking about the NFL, my New York Giants, how bad they are, our Washington Capitals, who are doing pretty well. Um, and they wanted me to talk about some evidence-based work. So if this talk is really boring, guys, where are you, Roy? We can all blame him. Okay. All right. No, I'm going to be talking about, um, uh, really, as we think about how our understanding, our diagnosis, our assessment of concussion has evolved um, over the years. Um, we are now at a place where we have data that can help guide us in our, our uh, understanding and our management of kids. And so I'm going to go through some of the work that we've done over the last number of years in this way. Um, just a disclosure statement, uh, one of the things that I do do, this comes from my model car building experience as a eight-year-old, um, is I build things. And over the years, um, after having transitioned from working with kids with severe traumatic brain injury into working with kids with quote-unquote mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, we realized that we didn't really have the tools available to us. And so in my work with the CDC, we developed a whole bunch of these things. So I will be talking about some of these today. What we're going to want to do is to talk about this evidence-based approach. This does get to sort of a little bit of a nerdy level. Eh, there's a certain nerdy side to me as well, but that's okay. It will actually, especially when we're talking about making decisions about kids' needs, we want to have that, those decisions based on reasonable evidence. Um, and then, so I'm going to talk about this concept of reliable change. And then we're going to talk about how that sort of manifests as we're thinking about uh, different kinds of types or subtypes. You know, we, we have now evolved within our concussion world to, to really start to look at specifics and different ways that the injury can manifest in any given individual and then direct our treatment in that targeted kind of way. So that's what we're going to do. You've probably had the definition of concussion thrown up at least a few times uh, as of yesterday, but I'll again throw up just a, a basic uh, definition that tells us that this is a, an injury to the brain. We believe it is more of a software injury and that it's more electrochemically based and less so structurally based, although we're still learning things here, um, that after that force is applied, and again, Blaine can do all of the correction of my uh, terminology here, uh, in which then there is uh, or there are stretch and strain forces that are applied to that soft tissue releasing chemicals, uh, impeding the electrical transmission, um, and therefore affecting the way that that software system runs this computer up here, which is one heck of an important computer. Um, what that does then, of course, is change how the computer drives the body and, and functions. Um, and with that, we know, of course, that that brain is pretty vulnerable after that state, and which is why we put all of our, our good efforts to protect that brain. But then we need to look at how we're going to help that individual recover. Because the brain, in fact, does have some reasonable resources to uh, normalize those chemical 
uh, changes uh, to normalize that electrical conduction. Um, but as I often say to the patients that I work with, our best effort is to not get in the way, to not screw up what the brain naturally is able to do in recovery. When we talk about a child going to school, it, it, it's a challenge because we're really stressing that software system. So let's, let's talk about a number of the things that we can look at here. The whole idea, so I'm a, I'm a, a neuropsychologist. I base my diagnostic decisions on behavior, on thinking, on emotion. To me, we've always been on the outside looking in from the perspective of brain function. Um, that bothers some of my physician colleagues. They want the blood test, they want the, um, and maybe we'll get there at some point, you know, the MRI scan, maybe we'll get there at some point. Um, but at this point, what we are basically doing when we are diagnosing someone is to, to think about how confident are we that this individual who presents in front of us does or does not have an injury. And we sort of think of it as a thumbs up, thumbs down, yes, no kind of decision. One of my very good friends and colleagues, Chris Giza at UCLA, had said, maybe we ought to think this, of this along a spectrum as well. You know, can we say that there was a definite reported mechanism of injury? Um, can we say that there was a, a typical onset of symptoms within, and this is, you know, our best guess, 24 to 48 hours. Um, can we say that there has been some reasonable um, uh, trajectory of recovery over time, certainly within the, the first week or so? And is there some other alternative explanation that might in fact uh, tell us that this is not an injury? These are all factors that we need to think about and we need to build actually our evidence to understand that. And it's the way that we are now characterizing all of our injuries. I had a family that came to me a few years back and the mom said, um, I've had ch children with concussions before and I'm bringing my daughter in right now and she absolutely has a concussion. So I said, okay, what happened? Well, her brother kind of was playing around with her and pushed her up against the car and she hit her head. Okay, okay so there's a mechanism. About four weeks later, she started to develop headaches. And I thought, okay. And then she talked about how those headaches have not changed and how school is going very poorly. Well, as it turns out, I said to her, in my typical clinical sort of way, I have low confidence that this is a concussion. Uh, I think there are other things here. And as it turned out, the motivating force was, can, we get, can I get my daughter some help in school? And I said, oh, I can get your daughter help in school in many other ways, but we're not gonna diagnose a concussion here because very low confidence that you meet sort of those criteria along the way. Just because you have a blow to your head does not necessarily mean that you have a concussion. We have to look at that in the context of the timing and what would make reasonable sense in terms of, again, the software system being impaired. So when we're posed with these clinical questions, we want to know, do we have some reasonable evidence to sort of support our decision making. So is this person's symptom pattern consistent with a likely concussion? In the case that I just talked about, that symptom pattern starts four weeks later. There is no reason why symptoms should start with the brain sort of on hold after an injury four weeks later. Can we predict the length of recovery? This is so important, and this is so important when we talk about school. You know, is this likely to have a more prolonged recovery? Has the person made some clinically significant change in their functioning? That is, you know, not only from pre-injury to post-injury, now we can see that they've worsened in their functioning, but are they getting better over time? And how do we know that? And is the student at some higher risk now for some kind of problems with their academics, with their social and emotional functioning, with other kinds of functioning here. You know, how do we base those de decisions now? And so again, what we can look at is the evidence base that we have all developed over a number of years uh, to begin to inform our decisions around this, these kinds of questions. So you know, when, we, when we look at this now, we, we think about what are the domains that we want to be assessing? And we look at all these different areas that um, have emerged over the years. 
some of the, the more recent ones being ocular motor being recognized, our vestibular system being recognized, but we've also talked about the role of sleep and the role of cervical strain with this injury. Not necessarily that cervical strain diagnoses the concussion, but it certainly is a factor uh, that can play an exacerbating uh, or a, a complementary role. And we want to look at the change in these functions from pre-injury to s help us to establish the diagnosis. We all have seen the signs here, you know, what, what we see uh, when someone um, has a potential injury. We all see the symptoms that they report. Um, we've categorized them in various ways. Um, and when I first started to do this work back in 2002, 2003, we really did not have some of our tools available to us. And that's when we were uh, sort of uh, spurred on to think about, let's develop a, a tool that our, our primary care colleagues in particular could use. Because what we were finding is that people were just using any symptom that they happened to think was relevant or not relevant. Um, I had a friend once who called me and said, hey, you know, my daughter plays lacrosse, and her, her friend just got really slammed hard, went to the emergency department, and they said she did not have a concussion because she didn't vomit. And I said, well, that's interesting. That is their pet you know, sort of signature symptom that, uh, or sign really, that um, they use, but that's actually wrong. Um, that is an incomplete kind of process. And what we found was that people were sort of, again, assembling their diagnoses, not necessarily based on um, some good evidence. So we developed what we called the acute concussion evaluation, which is something that we wanted to put into every office, every emergency department, every place where we could now be more standardized. Um, and in that, we wanted to make sure we were defining the injury, that we were assessing for all of the, the basic symptoms that, were, um, uh, that we know about, uh, that we looked at risk factors that might be related to the concussion recovery, um, and then certainly we looked, we wanted to make sure in the acute setting that red flags uh, were attended to that might require some neurosurgical um, involvement, um, and then uh, making sure that the diagnosis is well established and that we have some sort of a follow-up plan here. Um, and so then we, we, we went out and we collected some data on uh, 350 plus kids, and we did um, our, our fun factor analysis, and we were able to demonstrate that these symptoms actually were pretty well uh, collected in these groups, um, the, the somatic, the emotional, the cognitive, and the sleep-related symptoms. Um, and what we also found is that uh, some of the early uh, instruments we wanted to um, look at and, and start to understand how these, um, these symptoms might line up, and we found that um, you know, these, these percentages of um, occurrence of these symptoms actually lined up pretty well with some of the early uh, measures, and so we were validating these things along the way. So we were beginning now to say, okay, our initial evidence is telling us that these full set of symptoms are something we should attend to. Now, over the years, again, as um, maybe we've gotten smarter or, or, or we finally sort of figured it out, we realized that, in fact, Again, we can break down these symptoms uh, in ways the headaches, the vestibular, and the ocular motor is actually a way of our taking our physical symptoms and beginning to spread them out in terms of some sub-elements, still the cognitive, the emotional, um, and then we also have what we call the associated conditions that can interfere with recovery um, or even be affected by recovery, sleep, which is fairly consistent across many of these injuries that sleep is... Uh, is, is a potential factor, and as I mentioned, the cervical strain. And with that, we said, okay, that's a great idea. Can we demonstrate some evidence? And so we, we uh, published a paper a few years, uh, actually a few months ago, I guess about six, seven, eight months ago, in neurosurgery, um, where we looked at the evidence for both kids and adults and said, is there evidence that this kind of a clustering 
of these symptom subtypes um, is reasonable. And we found that, in fact, we could classify um, these symptoms in this way. And we had a variety of measures and, and different ways of looking at it. And then we established some of the statistical bases for these as well, um, looking at uh, the prevalence um, across kids and so and adults. And what we found is that these subtypes seem to have some reasonable evidence that if you're looking at a vestibular issue, you know, that dizziness, the balance problems, uh, uh, that there may be something we need to do to, to specify that. So we're beginning now to define and, and to validate what I think good clinicians have been you know, telling us now for a number of years. That brings us then to, so, so that's sort of the setup. You know, can we sort of say that with this injury, there are a set of symptoms, uh, a set of manifestations, if you will, that appear after the blow to the, to the head um, or just the movement of the head in more of a whiplashing way that gives that stretch and strain effect that then impedes the software system. So we can go further now. And this is some of the work that we've been doing here. So when we talk about evidence-based assessment, <clears throat> we want our clinical tools to help us do a number of these things. Number one, establish the likelihood of diagnosis. You know, is it that this pattern of, of, of outcome, symptom outcome, is more or less likely associated with the diagnosis of concussion? Can we help to figure out, does it predict the time to recovery? Again, if we can do some work where we can understand, eh, you're likely to be the person that's gonna take longer to recover versus shorter to recover, we can then begin to assemble our resources and help that individual. And then again, a complicated uh, recovery, are there certain kinds of symptoms that may be uh, impeding? The, 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 can we define the need for, and the kinds of treatment that you might need? And then of course, you know, as, uh, one of my very important areas is that return to school. How do we understand what you might need or not need as we support you in your return to school? And, and then, of course, the physical activity, sports and recreation, which the kids really want to know. They're like, eh, school, yeah, maybe. Sports, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, and so we want to examine all the factors that go into making these kind of predictions. As a clinician, as a school-based uh, provider, we want to know, is this something that we can uh, sort of help us to make in these decisions? So again, this assessment helps us to just to refine our predictive capability of, of these known factors and measures that would help us understand the likelihood of these kinds of issues, improve our understanding of the probabilities of certain outcomes, um, and allow us to better target where we're going to intervene. Um, and then finally, the evidence-based model will help us to understand when clinically important change has occurred, either from you know, baseline pre-injury to now post-injury, but also recovery over time. So this concept of reliable change, usually this is the part of the program where the eyes dim, we start to fall asleep, he's talking about nerdy stuff, all right. I'm not throwing Blaine's pictures of all these biomechanical stuff up here, guys. This is real stuff, okay? Oh, sorry, so is Blaine's. All right, all right. What, me again? He gets no break. The good thing, he's a good affable guy who later will kick me in the tail, but he's smiling now. Anyways, so we know that behavior and really symptoms are, they're defined by how you see them and how they're reported. But they're intrinsically and naturally variable. We also know that when we try to measure things, our little rule stick, so to speak, our measurement stick, is also inherently a little bit variable um, and has some, some errors in it, okay? So our challenge is to know what is real change in this individual's function from the fact that the ruler may have a little bit of wobble in it and the fact that their behavior from day to day may have a little bit of wobble in it. And so basically our job is to figure out the wobble factor, okay? And that's what reliable change is about, establishing the wobble factor. That's with two Bs, W-O-B-B-L-E. So if we assess reliable change, again, 
we can think about this, um, you know, a lot of times when we do our research, we say, ah, group A is very different from group B, therefore, and then you go, oh, yeah, okay, so how does that apply to my kid who is literally sitting in front of me? Our individual change models allow us to do that. We want to know that we can find clinically meaningful and reliably clinically meaningful change that would not occur in sort of the normal wobbleness of life, okay? And so we talk about, t can these changes occur in less than 10% or less than 20% of the population? There's been some significant literature over the last decade, really more than a decade, in, in individual psychotherapy, in uh, various kinds of surgery. My epilepsy colleagues are using this. We've, we're doing it now in sport-related concussion, where we can apply these methods. And so, again, what does clinically meaningful change mean? It means that the, the change is large enough, again, to surpass the wobble, if you will, the, the, the normal variability. And so, and it needs to be reliable. You can't say that, hey, he changed by 10 points, but that just happened to be a good day. And the next day, he's really not that, okay? So we have to make sure that this change is real and that we can uh, sort of say that the reliability of those, the change in those scores is, is clinically significant. So how do we do that? Well, this is where the reliable change index comes in. And I'm not gonna get into the whole statistical argument around it, but I will tell you that um, it's a metric again that tells us, um, is that individual's performance, behavior, falling beyond the range that, again, the wobble factor would, would likely uh, be responsible for. And so what it does is it tells us, again, the standard deviation of a score, that's the wobble factor of the measure, um, versus the, I'm measuring you from time one to time two, and the wobbliness in that as well. Um, so uh, we're establishing a new term here, Blaine, called the wobble factor, okay, so, okay. And we get this thing called the standard error of measurement, the standard error of difference. Um, again, I'm not gonna get into the nerdy side of that because you'd see all of these, these really crazy, and in, to be honest with you, they sort of drive me nuts when I open up a paper and I see these sigmas and these things. I'm like, what the heck is that? Wobble factor, that's all you need to know. And we wanna know that again, that RCI is, is, is really telling us a change well out beyond what would be normally expected. So. Relating this to concussion, we ask two fundamental questions to help us inform our clinical decisions. Number one, when you come to me, are your post-injury symptoms that you're reporting clinically different from how you were before? So is the post different from the pre? By, do, by establishing this, it tells us whether that is a significant issue we need to address as we target our interventions. All of this is about intervention, ultimately. The second question, say we now have established that yes, you seem to have a symptom cluster that is beyond what we would expect of someone without this injury and you without this injury. Can we say that over time now, you are making the progress that we want you to be making? Because again, this informs us as to whether we are putting the interventions in place that is helping your brain do the job that it normally does in recovery. So these are the two basic questions that we want to surround our reliable change around. And so we developed something we call the RAPID score. And the RAPID score is the retrospective adjusted post-injury difference score. Huh? <laughs> I know it's early. So what we're interested in is what were you before? Because most of the time we don't have people walking in where we have their, their behavior and their functioning well defined ahead of time. Even with all the baselining that we do in some people these days, it's, we're interested in what were you like before, what are you now? And we can look at adjusting your post-injury state with what you were before. So yeah. I tend to be a little bit drifty in my attention, normally, but now I really feel like I can't attend very well. By the way, I just put my hand up here and stopped that light from hitting me in the eyes. Good morning. <laughs> I didn't
didn't even know these people existed out here. <laughs> Is that the idea? Blind them and he won't know who he's talking to. All right, good. It's a, it's a good strategy. But I feel bad. I didn't even know you guys were there. Um, so the retrospective adjusted post-injury difference score, AKA the rapid score, is what we use as our fundamental uh, uh, metric. And again, applying this here, it addresses two essential questions. Is there a change from what you were before to what you are now after the injury? In other words, does a real symptom kind of exist here? And then we can also say, okay, I'm testing you now a couple of days after the injury, and now I'm test testing you about a week later. Are you different? Are you changing in that way? So we can look across this. And again, we'll use our reliable change metrics to answer these particular kinds of questions. So we have developed a, a toolkit over the years. Again, originally it was the ACE, and then with our, our CDC funding, we developed something called the Post-Concussion Symptom Inventory that, again, outlined those uh, 20 plus or minus symptoms for parents and for kids, but we also expanded that to look at some of the executive function elements that even go further in defining this. And we, we developed something we call the post-concussion executive inventory. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these here. Originally, when the CDC had, had asked us to, to do this research, we, again, were trying to validate a, a set of tools that would help us to, um, to understand this injury. And so we, we developed three different versions for kids, uh, depending on your age, from 5 to 7, 8 to 12, and 13 on up, and uh, published the um, psychometric characteristics of that, found, again, that those four symptom categories seemed to work well, um, that we could, again, uh, assess kind of the pre- to post-injury kind of changes. Um, again, it had some developmental sensitivity. Um, you don't ask a six-year-old if they're feeling mentally foggy. They look at you like, what? You know, and they look out the window and they go, it's not foggy. <laughs> Although as I was driving in last night and I said, you know, hopefully I get a room that looks out onto the, the falls, which you guys set me up with beautifully. Thank you. He goes, yeah, unless it's a foggy day. I was like, oh, yeah. Spend all that money and then, boom, nothing. <laughs> you only guess that there's falls back there. So, but that's what a six-year-old would think about if you ask them if they're feeling mentally foggy. You don't do that. So we have to think about how we temper this in ways to engage kids, uh, but we also always use a parent report as well, a parent observation report. Believe it or not, as parents, we are useful for some things. Again, the adolescents question that, but, um, and so the PCSI was developed. Um, we then trans, sort of translated that into now our evidence-based tool um, that we've just published called the, the PCSI-2. Um, and in that, what we're doing now is we're asking that question. We're asking, um, number one, how are your current symptoms? Tell us about that, headache and uh, nausea, balance problems, cognitive difficulties. But we're also asking, how were you before? See, I believe very, very um, seriously that when we ask people to make judgments about their symptoms, they are inherently thinking about how they were before that. So let's make that explicit. How were you before? How are you now? That is the index of difference um, that we see here, and that is the rapid score. We are retrospectively adjusting that post-injury score by looking at its difference. And we can ask that of, the parent, of, of adolescents and of kids and, and also of, of uh, their, their parents as well. And so again, we then look at the current post-injury, we look at the change index, this, the metric that would tell us, are you different from before? But we can also look across time here, okay? And so we did this in, in uh, some pretty large samples of kids, uh, close to 1,500 kids came in to see us, um, both parents and, and kids uh, of different ages, and we then follow them over time, um, and we developed these various kinds of metrics to help us. And so what we can see here um, on the, the, the sheet here is the PI is the post-injury, where I'm at, and this would be for a youngster. So an 8 to 12-year-old basically rates whether they have the problem or not and whether it's there a little bit or a lot. So it's only a three-point scale. 
which we believe is, is a better metric than the seven-point dimensional scale. Many people think that, just as a little side here, Blaine, I'm just kind of throwing a little bit, you know, again, nerdy sort of facts. So many people think that the L-I-K-E-R-T method is the, anybody know that name? I heard, yell that out. Yes, but no. So I've got a name that people torture all the time. You know, the Italians, eh, you know, all these vowels they throw in there. Like, how the heck do you come up with a G with all those vowels? Gioia, all right? That's how you come up with it. G-I, G, O-I-A, Gioia. Very, very, right? But Dr. Lickert <laughs> somehow had his name memorialized as Likert. And I challenge any of you to Google L-I-K-E-R-T, and you will see when it comes up in Wikipedia, it says the most mispronounced name in science. And they interviewed his son. And he said, yeah, dad was always called Likert, but it's Likert. So wait. it's a fun fact to know and tell. And the reason is that when I was in graduate school learning my statistics, my statistics professor said, I know Dr. Likert, and it is not Likert. So anyways, I sort of a little joke here. But anyways, so we put this on a dimensional scale, we stay away from the Likert word. It could actually be confused with liquor scale, and we want to stay away from that. Um, but the bottom line is we're looking at how we are now taking pre and post into account here and developing that rapid score. And what we can do now is to, on the right side on that scoring table there, uh, there it is, sort of, um, we can actually take that rapid score and we now have these reliable change metrics that tell us whether your change score, say in your physical symptoms, is not a significant difference from uh, pre, or whether it falls into a significant range. Um, and so, and we also have on the left side what we call the validity score. And that helps us to understand, is your reporting of your symptoms unusual? Maybe you didn't understand, maybe you're trying to minimize, maybe you're trying to maximize your symptoms. Can we sort of establish that this seems to be a valid reporting? It's very important when you're doing these kinds of measures to have the validity side. So we have that whole uh, index there on the, the left side. We can also look at the severity of your symptoms. And so we have what we call the minimal range where um, basically those are the scores that fall below the, the RCI levels. But then we can also look at, do you have a low burden of symptom, a moderate burden of symptom, or a high burden of symptoms? And this is gonna be very important as we think about um, how we're going to help someone. What we know is that the length of recovery is in part affected by that severity of, of symptom burden. And so somebody has, let's say, on the top scale, a total score that is a 62, which exceeds the, the high range, um, we know that that may be somebody who's gonna need some supports for a period longer than someone who has, say, a total score of 14 or even seven. Um, and so we look at that. Now, we also then wanna track this over time. And so what we can do now is, is look at this tracking mechanism and look at how are your rapid scores as we then follow you from time one to time two. So I saw you uh, maybe about five days after the injury and now, or, or say you were in school and you know, we, we saw you after the first week and now we're re-measuring you and seeing how you're doing and we see actually that you are or you are not making significant change. And we can look at scores that tell us that there's a significant worsening of your symptoms and this does happen if we find out that actually the supports are not in place and someone is now really having much greater challenges um, or there's no change or there is actually some significant improvement. So we can now begin to look at uh, that metric of is our intervention doing what we're hoping it will do and is that recovery following the rules, so to speak. So the other thing that we have done is to assess um, and include these executive functions, which is really kind of an expansion of both the cognitive and the emotional uh, control factors 
in this. And so we have this measure we call the PCEI that looks at your working memory. Now working memory, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, is a very, very important uh, concept uh, for all of us, but certainly for students. Right now, I am challenging your working memories uh, by giving you information. You are holding it in your head for a period of time. You may be relating it to what you knew before, or you're really kind of working on it to incorporate it as new information. The only way you can do that is to hold that in your mind for a period of time as you are working on it and you are working with your memory as you are trying to establish that in, in a long-term memory store. That working memory is, is subject to many, many disruptive influences. Fatigue, so if some of you had a poor night last night with sleep. Alcohol, if some of you had a poor alcohol night last night before sleep. Anxiety, injury, and probably many other things as well. It disrupts that holding system. So coming into school and hearing the teacher talk and, and lecture, looking up and down at the board, trying to hold that information in your head as you're taking notes, if that information slips away, is a real problem. And we have found that working memory is a very important element here. Um, the other element here is controlling your emotions and, and how well you're able to manage that. And so, obviously, I've, I've, I've ticked off Blaine. He's leaving. All right, there have been enough jokes, you know, and he's done. He is done. So we're going to have to find another speaker. He's not coming on. We got <laughs> so we developed the, the, um, the PCEI that, again, helps to capture those elements of, of working memory, of emotional control, of being able to complete tasks along the way. And again, we use the rapid score. Um, we're able to uh, identify with RCIs whether you've made significant, uh, a significant difference from your pre-injury functioning in these areas. And then also over time, um, have you, are you changing, are you improving um, in that uh, time one to time two? So again, we want to be using our evidence now to help us uh, not only establish, but to track. So I'm going to move through this. So then we get to the point of, can we look at the question of, are you likely to be someone who is a relatively brief recovery person or a long recovery person? <clears throat> Some of you may be familiar with the work that Roger Zemeck out of uh, CHEO has done across uh, Canada, banding together nine emergency departments and collecting data on over 3,000 children from the point of the emergency department out to 12 weeks. Roger's uh, main goal was, can I predict in the emergency department the factors that may tell me that you're gonna take longer than four weeks to recover? And so it's a very important study. They actually used our, our not only the ACE, but the PCSI was one of the co-investigators with this. Uh, but really this is Roger's brainchild and this is, this is actually some of the best work that has been done uh, to date on the, uh, the natural history, if you will, of, of concussion and concussion recovery. What we found, first of all, is that about 70% plus or minus of kids are symptomatically recovering by about four weeks. That means that 30% are not. And that means, again, if we think about translating that into any kind of intervention, and especially school, we have you know, maybe a quarter, maybe a third of the kids that are going to likely need some surveillance and some assistance for more than a month. And that's not insignificant, as we know. So <clears throat> what he wanted to do, though, is to, to come up with a prediction rule as to how we would be able to predict whether you are the long or the short recoverer. And so we published this paper, the clinical risk score, for this persistent post-concussion symptoms in kids and found that a 12-point scale actually did an okay job and certainly did a better job than when a clinician in the emergency department was making their best guess. The clinicians were about 55% accurate, which basically means I'm flipping a coin and half of me thinks that you're going to take longer than four weeks. The other half of me thinks you're going to take less than four weeks. Okay, And found that these 
predictors here, demographic characteristics, young or old, boy or girl, your history factors, uh, somebody talked Blaine back into giving the talk. He's back. He is back. I'm glad that. Thank you. We're all, we're all relieved. History factors here. So do I have a history of prior concussions that took longer than a week to recover? My, um, my, my medical history of, of a physician-diagnosed migraine history, these seem to be important factors here. And then the clinical exam and the symptom assessment. Those factors together help us to predict whether you're at low, medium, or high risk to take longer than four weeks. So what we have now is a tool that can help us look at these kinds of questions and guide a family a little bit more and not simply say, eh, some of the research said it'll take seven to 10 days to get better. And that's actually not evidence-based for kids. So the risk uh, clinical score here is, is a really important element. Now, let me just say it's not perfect. It's only 70% accurate, which means 30% eh, of the time it's not right either. But at least it begins to kick us off and it's better than the flip of the coin, okay? And this is well acknowledged um, in, the, uh, you know, in the paper. So we're beginning to look with evidence at what we might be able to tell a family and a child as to what their likely recovery length will be. And then we get to the question now of predicting school problems post-injury. And this is, again, uh, at the heart of what uh, my work has been. So some of you may know my history is actually originally working in schools. I, I was a school psychologist back in the early 80s. I was 14 years old at the time. <laughs> Child prodigy. Yeah, something like that in my own mind. Anyways, uh, so, and, and what we find, you know, I've been in, in hospitals literally over the last 30 some odd years, and which makes me only 40 something, okay. Um, <laughs> so the, the number one question that the vast majority of kids and parents have is, how is this neurologic condition, whether it's a brain injury, whether it's epilepsy, whether it's, you name it, going to affect my child's future and their educational future. And so we've been very focused on how all these kinds of conditions um, can affect school, school performance. Um, and so how can we predict this? So originally, um, we were looking at, can we first just define what are the kinds of academic problems? Uh, and so we published a paper in pediatrics back in 2014 uh, Danny Ransom was one of our postdocs, um, and we collected data. And uh, in this, we wanted to define the kinds of academic challenges that kids would have with, with data. Um, and the results were we, we, we took a group of kids that were not recovered, and we actually compared them with a, a sample of kids that were, not reco that were recovered, so that we had some similar background characteristics. Um, and what we found, number one, again, is that higher symptom burden Again, think about low, moderate, high symptom burden. Um, seem to predict a higher level of problems. It's a little bit of a duh statement. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Um, and that um, the uh, high school kids seem to report greater problems than their younger cohort. And interestingly, in the uh, 5P study, in terms of length of recovery, one of the points, or actually two of the points that you get on that clinical risk score is if you are an adolescent versus a younger child, you are, again, more likely to take longer to recover. We didn't actually look at the sex effects here, but what we do know is that girls relative to boys seem to have a different recovery trajectory, maybe being a little bit longer, um, and that um, their cognitive functioning was more impaired uh, as well. So it was just empirical evidence of what we might want to be you know, looking at and targeting here. And these are the kinds of things that we looked at originally in this study with these seven kind of areas of uh, headaches interfering with your work, difficulty paying attention, feeling too tired to be able to uh, complete work, homework taking much longer, troubles understanding material, 
difficulty studying uh, for things and difficulty taking notes. And what we see is that as you move from the elementary level up to the high school level, you have increasing lengths or increasing numbers, if you will, of, uh, of problems. So the demands are certainly more significant. So uh, a, uh, an average of four of those seven problems in high school students, that's not a good day, quite honestly, if you're going back to school and you're dealing with four out of those seven problems. So then we wanted to, again, look at can we predict, similar to what um, Roger Zemeck did with kind of the outcome uh, clinical risk score, can we predict who might have the greater academic problems now? And so what we did in this model is took our, the history of kids, their age, their sex, we looked at their symptom scores, we looked at their cognitive functioning, and we looked at something we call the exertional score, which is when I put you under the gun of, of, of cognitive activity, do your symptoms worsen? Is there an exertional effect, which is a very important element. I'm not talking about it too much here today, but it's a very important element that we try to manage. In other words, is the brain sort of screaming back at you, you're doing a little too much right now and you're hurting me? Um, so what we did is we used, again, this modeling where we wanted to predict if you're going to have a good recovery, and we actually defined that by taking that problem scale, and it was the lower number of problems versus the higher number of problems. And what we found is that your symptoms on the post-concussion symptom inventory and the executive complement on the PCEI were the strongest uh, predictors, both uh, whether it was a child or a parent reporting that. Interestingly, the least predictive was what your current cognitive performance was on testing. And what was more of a medium predictor was your exertional score, your exertional symptom readings. So the point here is that by taking our symptom assessments and tracking that over time, that seems to be a good way of understanding how uh, your academic uh, performance might be. So what we then did um, and this is just some of the, we call it the area under the curve, or basically it's the index of strength of prediction. And you can see that the child's report of their executive function was a 0.84, and of their overall symptoms on the PCSI um, was uh, right next to it, you know, 0 0.84, 0 0.80. Those are it's pretty strong predictor values. Um, and then it moves down as you go along. So what we've done since then is to expand on that academic tracking tool we call the CLASS, the Concussion Learning Assessment and School Survey. Because what's in a name? You got to know the acronym, right? So CLASS. Um, and what we do, and, and what I, we, we've developed the CLASS, uh, um, the, the first version was that version that we used in that, that pediatrics paper that had seven problems, seven school problems. We've since expanded that to 14 school-related problems. What we did in that first study is we basically said, are you having this problem, yes or no? Now what we've done is expanded out, are you having it not at all, are you having it a little bit, is it a moderate problem, is it a severe problem? So we now have it on a four-point scale. That allows us then to expand, if you do the math, 14 times three, 42, to a scaling of 42. Um, we also asked the question, just in general, how worried are you, how concerned are you about you know, your, your academic functioning being affected here. Um, and we put that on a dimensional scale as, as well. And so these are the 14 problems that we ask now. And by the way, if any of you want a copy of the class, happy to send it to you. Um, and we use this as a tracking tool. Our, our colleagues in Oregon are now using this as a tracking tool, and we're using this now in a number of our studies um, as, a, as a, a measure. We also ask, what are the stressful kinds of things that you are experiencing? And so here we're looking at, you know, is missing time with friends or social activities, not being allowed to play your sports or recreation, not having enough support from your teachers or your parents, being more stressed out or overwhelmed with your schoolwork piling up, um, stressed out about your grades dropping. By the way, how did we develop this? We listened to kids and we put on the form what the kids have told us are the concerns, and now we put it on a dimensional scale so we can look at that level. And, um, and then we were very interested in what subjects may be affected. And by the way, in our original pediatric study, the number one 
class that was the kids had the greatest uh, not only concern but difficulty was was what math math has the greatest working memory demand number one it's a foreign language because it really is you know symbols that are being manipulated held multiple steps going into it your holding tank your working memory is really pretty heavily stressed in math having said that right behind it was English and so you know paragraph reading reading long texts all that is is also a challenge as well the best class by the way that we found was the art class so the art teachers are a good place for our kids to go when they need a break right but anyways, we want to know, we want to gather from them what, how they see this affecting them, okay? And then we've asked them, you know, what do you think you need and what are you getting? So we can kind of monitor the, 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 their progress in being given interventions. And we've, we've now developed the scoring system where, again, the overall concern is a, on a zero to three dimension, the academic problems is on a zero to 42 dimension. We actually have broken that out. In fact, we're doing some psychometric analyses of the class three right now where we're looking at uh, things that involve just symptoms like my headaches interfere or my fatigue interferes or things that are actually academic related. I'm having troubles with reading or, or you know, math, that sort of thing. And then we have dimensional uh, stress uh, items as well as the subject areas we can dimensionalize. And then the idea is that we would track this over time together with one symptom. Um, so again, what, and, and again, we, we, I will say with the class three right now, we're, we're looking, we're basically developing our evidence base to look at what are the typical kinds of trajectories we can actually develop reliable change indices for typical recovery of your academic concerns. So this allows us then to then target what we're gonna do. And we developed something we called the STAMP, the Symptom Targeted Academic Management Plan, uh, which is a way to take those symptoms that are on the left side of that uh, scale, look at how it may affect you in school, which is the middle section, and now what kinds of supports can we build that's in the right column there. And that is a way now of us targeting specifically for that individual's symptom profile the kinds of supports that we want to put in place that we can then monitor not only their symptom recovery, but also their academic recovery as well. So in summary, and with about 10 minutes left for questions, not bad, huh, Ken? Uh, we want to use evidence-based methods now. We are at a place where we've got data that can help guide our clinical decision making. It allows us to gain some confidence in our diagnostic decision making. It allows us to know what areas we want to be targeting for treatment and it helps us then to track that recovery process to know whether things are proceeding the way we want or not. It's very important for us to be assessing that child's unique symptom profile so that we can understand what they might need. And again, that reliable change index is that statistical method to inform us, is this clinically significant change from pre-injury to post and from um, change over time in the recovery process. We developed, again, the concept of this rapid score because we do not necessarily have pre-injury symptoms for, for most of our kids. We can ask them right ahead of time, how were you before? How are you now? Is there a difference or not? And then across recovery, we can use these methods to know, are we making significant progress? Are we getting worse? Or are we just not changing? And therefore, we can adjust our uh, our our um, interventions accordingly. So I'm going to stop right there and uh, thank you for your good attention this early in the morning and thank you for the people that are over here too. And I'm happy to take some questions for the next uh, seven and a half minutes. So what sort of questions do we have? Yes. for the tools that you spoke about, how when you do visit one, visit two, visit three, and you're comparing the symptom profiles, how much time typically between visits? Would ah. it be weekly or monthly or? No, so, so it's um, the typical time between the visits is roughly about two weeks. Okay. The metrics work, but, but there's a range obviously. So the metrics work really, you know, we, we typically think from one week out to three weeks is not a bad range. It seems to fit with those metrics. 
I'd, I'd like to ask about treatment. Like for an ordinary concussion, I, I know that if the person has severe sleep symptoms, they need, you know, like a sleep expert. But for an ordinary concussion, what do you recommend for treatment? I'm gonna, can you hold up a little closer? What partner? do you recommend for treatment for an ordinary concussion? Treatment. Okay, what about treatment, sorry? What, what do you recommend? Like I've, I've heard ah. treatment mentioned, but I don't really know what's being done yeah. to, in that treatment. So we didn't get into that in full here, but um, so based on the, the stamp is actually a good, uh, so again, what we're trying to do is to accommodate the brain to allow it to recover. Um, now, we used to use the proverbial four-letter word, and I think I may have talked about this last time in one of my previous talks, which is rest as the simple uh, recovery, but that is not where we're going now. We are now looking at a moderated kind of uh, treatment approach where uh, maybe in the first few days we, we uh, help someone um, by, by relative rest, uh, but then we begin to re-engage them into their activities and we accommodate each of the symptoms by man. So for example, if, if I'm very light sensitive, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna sit you away from uh, an area where the bright sunlight comes into my classroom, or I may even have you wear sunglasses. Um, if I am a little unsteady on my feet and I'm trying to get from class to class and I have to go up you know, one or two flights of steps, uh, maybe I get the elevator key. So we're doing all the kinds of accommodations based on what your symptoms are. But with the idea that we're trying not to overexert or underexert the, the brain as it's recovering. So that's a whole nother discussion uh, for possibly another day. Um, but again, it's gotta be specific to that individual's symptom profile, their clinical profile, that we then target which interventions. And again, we might have a vestibular therapist, we might have some vision, we might have some cognitive work, we might have some emotional support, we might be doing certain things for headaches. So each of those sub areas that I mentioned, those subtypes, have a variety of interventions that can go in there. In so that's in brief. Yes. And I'm just oh sorry, wondering what the impact is when kids ignore that, and is that potentially what's impacting? So the question is kids? limiting screen time, um, which by the way is clearly a you know, a first world problem here. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, and I've always been fascinated uh, by that. Uh, and I, I have a, regular conversations with families about this. So what does looking at a screen do to you? Because there's many different kinds of screens. You've got your phone, you've got a television, uh, potentially you've got an iPad, um, you've got a whiteboard, which actually is the, the worst ones for quite honestly, at, uh, um, or smart board as they're called. Um, killer board is what the concussion kids call them. Um, but, uh, so there are elements that go into that. Are you light sensitive? Some are, some aren't. Are you over focusing? Some are, some aren't. You know, is there something about tracking? Some are, some aren't. So we, we've got to figure out what's, the, what's going into that problem with the screens. Um, some kids may not be light sensitive, but they may get real exertional when they're over-focusing for too long, but they don't have any visual tracking problems. So in that case, I'd say, okay, we're going to limit your amount of concentration. Do it more, kind of less frequently, you know, but in, I always tell kids, take your day in doses. Take your screens in doses. That doesn't exacerbate your symptoms. So the question is, you know, the other part of your question is, what's the consequence of overdoing it? So whether it's screens or anything else, the consequence, we don't understand 100%, but we're sort of using the idea that if you sprain your knee badly and you continue to jump up and down and run on and cut out and do all this kind of stuff day after day after day after day, it's likely to prolong your recovery. Um, and, and, and hurt. <laughs> so we want to sort of limit that. Um, but, you know, somebody getting on their screen one time and worsening their symptoms, I'm not worried about that. So, you know, again, it's, it's a matter of, 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 of what are the elements that go into the screen or really to any activity um, that sort of fits with your symptom profile and how do we manage that and limit that in a way. And I tell kids, we're taking your lifeblood away when we 
uh, when we take your phone or whatever away. How can we do that in a reasonable managing way that doesn't put you in concussion jail, as I often tell kids, um, but allows you some you know, parole time, so to speak? Hi, Dr. Joya. <laughs> Hi. Um, okay. There's just a, been a bit of disappointment in the room, I think, after yesterday surrounding baseline testing. Um, and obviously your rapid score sort of looks at pre and post. And Sorry, I have a good part A, part B to this question. Um, with regards to your pre-injury scoring, you're, you're asking it retrospectively. Do you find that there's sort of like an expectation bias when you're asking children and parents to grade their symptoms and you're kind of relying on them being good historians about how they were before and also saying, well, you know, this is where I think my kid used to be, but now they have a concussion, so they should be here. Do you know what it means? Yeah. Versus yeah. doing a true pre-injury baseline, right, where they were asymptomatic before and now they're not. So just yeah. your thoughts on that? So the, yeah, that, that's an issue. Um, actually, my good colleague Brian Brooks has looked at this whole um, Raider bias kind of thing. Um, and uh, we've actually examined that, and we don't actually find that in the vast majority of kids there's any kind of a, a Raider bias over time. In fact, one of the things in the, in the 5 P study, um, each time the youngster was assessed, um, and that was at the time of uh, the emergency department, at one week, at two weeks, at four weeks, at eight weeks, and at 12 weeks, we actually looked at the retrospective baseline um, symptom assessment and it was flat the whole way. There was not any change, because one of the things is this idea that, you know, the further away you get from your injury, the more sort of halo effect, oh, I used to be really good at this, but now I'm not. Um, and uh, we did not find that kind of a bias in the assessment. Having said that, as a clinician, you always have to have your antenna up um, and to know whether there is some reason why there might be a biasing element. But it's also the reason why we have the validity factors in there. We're looking at, are you overly negative? You know, are you inconsistent in your responses? There's something about how you're rating that doesn't fit, and then that gives us some indicator as to whether maybe they're not and, and it's both for the retrospective baseline as well as the post-injury baseline. We have validity indi indicators on both. Time's up. Red. Big, big, uh, big letters. So thank you very much, folks. Thank you much, for Jerry. That was fantastic. I diagnosed myself with a concussion during that time. I'm almost positive I have one. Uh, so thank you again, Dr. Joy, for coming back. Thank you for delivering that message. Our next keynote speaker is Dr. Blaine Hashisaki. Dr. Hashisaki is a complex researcher in neural trauma in sports. He was supervised 40 masters and 11 doctorate students in the area of biomechanics of sports. With almost 40 years of experience in the field of biomechanics, Dr. Hashisaki has held academic positions at the University of Victoria. University of Lakehead, McGill, and Ottawa, and served as the Vice President of Product Research and Development for Bauer, Nike Hockey, Vice President of Hockey Company, CCM. His engineering and design teams have developed helmets for multiple of sports, including ice hockey, cycling, snowmobiles, lacrosse, football, as well as motorcycle helmets. Please join me, welcoming back Dr. Hashisaki. Okay, before you start the clock, I'd like to make some corrections. <laughs> Kevin, you took that packet of money not to call me the cutest brother, but the best looking brother. Um, I also know that a lot of you are thinking, just what you know, baseline is there for best looking in the Hoshizaki brothers? <laughs> it's not particularly high, I know that. <laughs> Um, before I get started, I want to say, I think most of you know this, um, that we've been, or I should say my brother Warren, who thankfully is not here today, uh, when we started this discussion around this conference, uh, our intention, or when we discussed this, it was not about, <clears throat> pardon me, bringing in world-class speakers to talk to you and inform you. It was to bring us together. 
and to, we realize the big part of making this successful, or the biggest part of making this successful, was going to be the participants. And I think those of you who have been here, some of you, for all of the conferences, realize that this is not about us, this is about us as a group. And what Kevin described in terms of we understand the importance of you being in this room, uh, we do. And we choose speakers with that in mind. We, of course, go after some of the best speakers in the world, and I think you know that. And uh, from that, we try to create this sense that we all are responsible for what we, we uh, uh, have identified as concussion, but I'm going to change that hopefully a little bit today. Okay, I guess we'll... One of the challenges around concussion is that and everybody here, no matter what area they're talking, is talks about how complex it is. Well, I deal primarily with the physical piece of the, uh, the biomechanics, and really what we're looking at is over 100 billion neurons. And that's trillions in terms of interaction of a relatively soft tissue that's very complex, has all kinds of characteristics that affect how it performs. It is the foundation of our feelings, our understandings, our memories, our hopes, um, our dreams, and love. This is why it's so important. Um, my background uh, as a, a professor at University of Ottawa, we have relationships, and a lot of the data we'll be looking at today originated with these uh, groups, the CIHR, NSERT, CHRP, NOXI, which is uh, a football group of de developing the standards for football helmets. Uh, we have a, we're going to see some data that we have collaborated with Harvard on the National Football League um, uh, health study. So this, the, I'd like to say that, and, and also CCM Hockey. CCM Hockey Company is a collaborative partner in which we do research together. A lot of this research you'll see comes from this research, or sorry, a lot of the data comes from this research, and they really involved uh, not just me, but the research team at, at the Neurotrauma Impact Science Lab at the University of Ottawa. And so my colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrew Post, Dr. Clara uh, Carton, and Dr. Jenny Cornoyer uh, all participated and led some of these studies. What I'm going to talk about is brain trauma and injury, as I usually do, brain trauma and mental health, not to the degree that you heard Dr. Joa just uh, discuss and, and uh, uh, describe to us in very detailed terms. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about trauma profiling in sport, and then trauma, brain trauma, and youth sport. Uh, I want to bring a comment that Paul Hunter, who is head of Rugby Canada, commented. And I was very impressed with this comment because for years we've tried to get this understanding. Our goal, and I'm sure you know that, is not to stop people playing sport. We want kids playing sport, all sport. And the only way going forward we're going to be able to do that is to collaborate with everybody here in the room and take ownership. And that's what Paul Hunter said. The sport organizations have to take ownership. We need them to take ownership. The last person you're going to listen to in terms of changing the game of hockey is me. If you've ever seen me play hockey, that's definitely not the way we play hockey. <laughs> we need the coaches. We need the organizations. We need the people involved that are on the ice level to make those decisions. What we can do is help explain why the game creates trauma the way it does. And as you've listened to Dr. Joa and Dr. Cantu uh, explain that they have the, these injuries or this trauma has long-term effects. And it, but it's not simple to understand because of the complexity of the organ that we're trying to uh, diagnose or cer certainly trying to uh, research. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about why and how trauma is created and why that uh, trauma creates injury in the brain. And then subsequently from that, talk a little bit about how we can manage trauma in sport and a way to the future. In other words, what are we going to see in the future? Because it is going to change. What we're talking about today is like, I think a lot of people would like to see it kind of disappear in our memory. 
It's not because we're getting better methods of measurement, better, better methods to understand how trauma affects the brain tissue. And as that becomes more and more prevalent, you will get to see a bigger part of this story. And it does, in, in what we're seeing today, it becomes more and more concerning. So I, uh, Warren told me I was not allowed to use any slides I'd used previously. So those of you who've been here before, I put them all together in one slide. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not here, so I don't really care. <laughs> so our, oops, I'm sorry. Our, our lab really, this is, we're reconstruction specialists. And so what we do is we look at injuries or we look at trauma that's experienced by uh, athletes and then we reconstruct them in the lab so that we can obtain dynamic response data over time. And using these dynamic response data, as you can see in the middle, I don't really know, is this? What? I guess I don't have a pointer. But if I do, I can't find it. Um, what, uh, what we then do is we run the dynamic response data through what's called a finite element model of the brain. And in this case, it's around 70,000 uh, elements that define the different characteristics of the brain. And then we can then get measurements in the different parts of the brain at different times, things like strain, stress, a uh, variety of mechanical measures. And those mechanical measures help us then establish the effect of the trauma, the impact, on the tissue itself, it gives us a better understand, a better way of predicting when we're damaging the tissue. So this is why, from here on in, we're going to talk a lot about strain, brain tissue strain, because for us, it's probably the best predictor we have right now that can predict damage to the tissue. And so what we look at now is traumatic brain injury, and that creates that results from high strains on brain tissue. You in sport, we're going to talk primarily about sport today. In sport, we don't really have a lot of, fortunately, we do not have a lot of traumatic brain injury. Concussion is something we worry a lot about. It's something we worry about because it's, we can diagnose it to a certain degree based on symptoms. And so it's front and center. However, the one thing we're missing, and Dr. Cantu referred to this when he started talking about other sorts of injuries, and his concern was primarily chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE. And that's the fact that when you're stressed, straining, putting strain on the brain, you are changing the environment in the brain in a variety of ways. It can, it can change, the, uh, create a concussion. It can create bleeds. It can damage the neurons. It can create infections. All these things are injury mechanisms that damage the brain and decrease the health of the brain, the mental health of the brain, and over time can manifest itself in terms of early onset uh, Parkinson's, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, dementia. It just lowers the capacity of the brain tissue. So this is why when we look at these things, it becomes extremely important to us because if we are creating trauma in our youth, young kids, sure, you may get them back and there's a lot of great programs that you've heard about how to get them back playing the game. But if they continue to be uh, traumatized, their brains continue to be traumatized, that adds up. So are we just, what sort of favors are we doing by creating an opportunity for the athlete to go back and play and be traumatized? It's like in boxing. If you get knocked out, they go, oh, that wasn't so good, you go home, and you never get back into the boxing rink, lesson well learned, it hurts. If you're talked back into that ring over and over again, and you're taught how to take a punch, how to, take a, uh, how to battle through it, and you increase your trauma, that becomes a problem. And so we want to make sure our athletes are not put in this position. And for me, I think one of the biggest changes we can do is, involves prevention is changing how we play the game, change how we protect our young athletes. So we'll talk a lot about that today. So here's an example of what I just talked about, is that we really have designed helmets, and I've said this before, um, 
We designed helmets so people don't die on the field. That's really where helmets came from originally. And so what we've done is really design, de developed a protective. It does help protect against concussions to a certain degree, no question. But what is done is made sure that our athletes were not dying on the field. It was not designed, and there are some innovations of which we, for tr transparency, we invented in our lab uh, a, a technology called fluid that were really designed to help manage rotation of the head because we knew with our research that there was the rotation characteristics that really create the risk for concussion, that strain, they strain the neurons. And so they are getting better. The helmets are getting better, but I can... Uh, We've tested tens of thousands of helmets, all kinds of helmets. And I can tell you that a helmet will not solve the concussion problem. It will not. We have to understand that. It'll help, but will not solve it. So we can't continue playing the game we're playing and expect things to change dramatically. It cannot. The concussion, as you've heard, so I'm not going to belabor this, a lot of good speakers talked about that there's both acute and persistence, the categories, and I think there's a continuum, as Dr. Joa described, that it's probably a continuum. It's not just you have one or the other. And your presentations, think about it for a minute. The frontline medical um, staff or medical worker that you're relying on is 10 years old. He's got to decide, oh, that's something wrong here. I better tell somebody that I had a concussion. I better tell somebody that of the 55 symptoms that were described, I got four of them, and they're pretty important. Ten-year-old's are doing that for you. Because if the ten-year-old does not tell their parent, does not tell their coach, it's not a concussion. Zero. This is when we do uh, reconstructions of a variety. And what's interesting here is, I, and I'm going, I don't have my... I just can't see it, I guess I should say. Um, but what we did to try and tease this out, and of course, this is what biomechanists do, is we said, okay, if we can understand the ones that were diagnosed concussions compared to impacts that were not diagnosed, is there a distinction between the two? And we did the same thing for ice hockey. Not much. I mean, from a statistical point of view, we can separate them out and we can get a correlation. But be quite honest, I'm not, as Dr. Joy pointed out, it's the wobble effect. Just how much variation do you have in your data to make it worthwhile? I could give you those things, but quite frankly, I'm not sure from a clinical perspective it would be that valuable to you. But we'll continue doing it because that's what academics do. <laughs> Just how many fairies are on that head of the pin? So when we think about concussions, one of the challenges we have in terms of predicting injury is that the definition, not definition, I shouldn't say, but the uh, diagnosis of concussion on the field. And, and most of you people know that most of the games that you play, whether it's uh, intramurals or it's even some varsity teams, um, you, you do not have the benefit of a really highly trained physician or, or medical care worker. That makes it challenging. And don't think you'll ever, and we're doing, we're making great strides in education. We are. And clearly in Ontario with the uh, Rowan's Law, th this is extraordinarily important. I cannot under, uh, uh, under um, stress that. However, don't think that kids are not going to hide this because they want to continue to play. They're going to. So they're not all of a sudden become, okay, I got to bump my head, I'm not feeling right. I'm reporting it, a big part of those kids will still not tell you because they still want to play. They still want to win the playoffs. They still want to do this. So it's important to understand we have to prevent that. We have to take that decision out of the hands of a 10-year-old. Reporting rate for con concussion is low. I believe it's getting better. And it's because of education, not just of the players, but the coaches, the People who are involved in the sport, they know what they're looking for, and, they're, and, and they have the interest of the health of the athlete. There's no question. So that is improving, but it's not going to go away. Um, the other thing is, if there's no symptoms, as we've seen here, and we believe a lot of these impacts that created strain on the brain have never presented with symptoms. 
If there's no symptoms, there is no concussion. So these are all being missed as well. And so important to us, of course, is what people have described as subconcussive. Well, subconcussive basic is any impact that you saw, but did not create symptoms or signs. So none of those are recorded as anything. And yet we know when we do reconstructions and we model them that, there is dam that we're creating damage to the brain tissue. How much and how important we still haven't completely uh, divine, sorry, defined that. So the concussion solution, education, absolutely. And I think as been demonstrated here in the last two days, we're making strides and very, very proud of being involved in this. Injury management, as Dr. Joa and uh, uh, Dr. Cantu, that's one word, uh, Kevin, not Cantu, it's Cantu. Um, uh, I was trying to explain it to him last year because he was introduced to him as Dr. Cantu. Um, so <laughs> I owe you a few, Kevin, so believe me. So the injury management's improved dramatically in the last few years from the work of the, the um, uh, researchers and the scientists working in this area. And the fact that they're involved in clinical work makes it all that more important. Uh, injury treatment, some of the things that we, uh, they, they are doing now is certainly much more precise than what we've had years ago. And a lot of you can remember that. It was almost like a mystery. Um, injury accommodation, uh, it, it, even in the last seven years that we've been addressing that in this conference, we've seen great strides. And that's frontline work and that's important work. So our goal was to develop a means to objectively measure brain trauma in sport. We wanted a way to measure trauma so that what we could do was look at different sports realistically and give coaches, uh, sport organizations, school systems a tool that they can improve and make the sports safer. And the reason we want to give the tool to, to coaches, to sport organizations, because we this way we believe we're going to, number one, have safer sports, less trauma, and number two, have sports that are going to be fun, and the athletes are going to want to play. And they're going to get all the benefits we all know that is foundational in participation in athletics and sports, social element, learning to compete, all these things that we value. Those will remain, remain integrity. That integrity will remain if we involve frontline people, because you understand that value. If I'm lecturing you on how to play hockey, like I said, nobody's going to be listening. So one of the things that we are a little bit guilty for, and that is we are now managing concussions a little bit better, just a little bit better, but we're not managing brain trauma and brain strains as well as we should, and we know that. So our concern now, in addition to concussion, is to look at repetitive brain injury. We think that's something we have to really address. And we've known this for a few years. We just haven't been able to measure it, or haven't measured it accurately. So that's one of the things we're interested in. Um, we know, for example, as uh, Dr. Cantu uh, described, that the longer duration, that the more impacts you get, the worse it is for mental health. The longer duration, of uh, trauma, the more likelihood you're going to have neurological problems later in life. And I know for those of you who are 20, 30 years old, you're going, well, you're 60 year old anyhow, or you're 55 year old anyhow, so you know, it doesn't much matter you can't find your way home from the store. <laughs> when you're 55 or 60, it does matter, just telling you. Uh, <laughs> People start to treat you a little differently when you get lost on the way to the store. Um, and the experiences that people have uh, as they get older are not pleasant experiences. Losing memories of your kids, of your grandchildren, of your life, not knowing that you were once in the NHL scoring goals, um, being confused, being aggressive, all these things are just destroys your life. And when you meet these people and you meet the wives of these people, uh, you begin to understand the implications that 
why what you're doing is so important. Um, and so what we're now interested in is not just making sure people don't die on the field, trying to manage uh, concussions more effectively on the field. What we're interested in is managing trauma. And the reason we're ma interested in managing trauma is their research is continuing, and there is research now that demonstrates that things, there's damage to the neurofilaments, to the white matter, molecular changes to the tau protein, which really is uh, what leads to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And uh, more recently, we're starting to look at uh, the relationship between trauma and the immune response. So these are three uh, elements that we believe, or three mechanisms, if you like, that we believe we need to understand better. Um, one of the things we use in our lab is that if you have a higher than 5% MPS uh, in the brain tissue, you should, we should be measuring it. Once we drop below 5%, we feel that that, to our feeling, first of all, it's whether or not our tools of measurement are, are precise enough below that level, and secondly, uh, whether an impact at that level matters. We have no evidence that it does create any sort of changes, so we do not measure below 5%. These are the diseases, and I think uh, Dr. Cantu has, has described them much better than I can do it, but clearly neurological uh, changes that affect your life uh, later, these ones are more later in life, uh, are well documented. And their effect on how you behave in unstable emotionally, depression, anxiety, forgetfulness, confusion, decreased cognitive function, headaches, personality changes. None of these are anything that you would like to develop as you get older. So Dr. Carton in our lab de developed this method of uh, measuring and she just uh, completed her doctorate, defended it, and published this in the family of um, nature. So it's been a well-received uh, tool, and we're very pleased with it, in which we measure magnitude, how hard you get hit, frequency, and we use a frequency magnitude mix in which we look at the frequency of different levels of, of magnitude. Uh, we measure interval, and then how long the person has been exposed to their duration. We feel that these, from a biomechanics perspective, capture the risk that we need to capture in order to ultimately predict injury. So in magnitude, we look at, we can use a variety of different measures, but we primarily look at the peak of the strain, the location of the strain, and how much of the brain tissue is involved in the impact, what percentage. Frequency, we go by day, by week, and by year. And it depends on the event. In boxing, for example, it can be a one-hour match or a 30-minute match, and the frequency is relatively high. In other sports, it can be really low, and the frequency is quite... Uh, uh, it, can be, it has to be measured in weeks and, and so forth um, because they have a different effect. Interval, again, same with frequency. It'll depend on the sport. And then duration, and this is what Dr. Cantu was referring to, if we can keep the kids out longer in terms of participating in an impact sport or contact sport, uh, it should, it's not really, it's collision sport is what it is, not contact because you're going to have contact. Uh, we can decrease the duration of exposure and that will bode well. I'm, much, I'm more conservative than Dr. Cantu, in fact, on this one and I'll describe why later. Um, I think you might have to start this one, Rob. So when we look at the sport, we, very, we typically look at the sport in terms of the professional because we see it on TV all day long. We say that's the sport. And therefore, when we do a lot of analysis, we will analyze the pros playing the game. Well, as I'm going to show you, that's typically not the game that's being played by the majority of the participants, children. Uh, in the pro game, and this is the study that Dr. Carton did with um, Harvard, in which we isolated their three profiles of trauma. There's a, the first one, and it's the quarterback, wide receiver, and defensive back. This characterized by high magnitude impacts, but very few impacts. The next is, uh, or sorry, let me go right to the far side, uh, to your right. And it's an offensive line, defensive line. Low magnitude, 
high frequency. And then we have this group in the middle, which is a linebacker, running back, and the tight end overlaps. And the reason the tight end overlaps, for people of you who know football, is their, their responsibility changes. So when we, it was kind of nice for us to realize this, is that the tool was so sensitive that it picked up that the fact that tight end plays a variety of roles or more than one role in the game, and we were able to pick that up. And they really created a third profile that has medium-level trauma, but also medium-level frequency. And so now we're using this methodology to try and connect this to what type of injury you're going to get. And so, once again, low frequency, high magnitude, quarterbacks and uh, receivers, I believe, medium frequency, medium magnitude, linebackers and running backs, high frequency, low magnitude was the linemen. These essentially were the categories that presented themselves. So why does this help us? And this is the first pass that Dr. Carton has done. So what we wanted to look at is we compared that to the rate of concussion and the rate of CTE. And so what we found, and if you look at the second one uh, where it says players percentage, we looked at overall and realized, well, it depends how many players are on the field. So we then looked at it in terms of people, uh, sorry, players, and the risk associated with quarterbacks and running backs is relatively high. With, with a wide receiver, tight end, the risk for concussion is very high. And also with the defensive back. So what this really is starting to tell us is that certain characteristics of trauma associate with how you play the game and what sort of trauma you're getting and the disease or the injury, whether it's concussion or CTE. Uh, we believe that this method or precision in this way of measuring trauma is going to become more and more important as we start to track the relationship, how much gets in the way, quite simple. The other thing we noticed, and we're going to investigate more, is the head to ground impacts are high and the energy levels are fairly high for this age group and we believe um, what we saw was they can't control the mass of the helmets. Football helmets, as you all know, is, are very heavy. When they go down, they hit their shoulders and they can't hold their head, stop their head from hitting the ground. And so we think this is very important as well to understand that mechanism more, um, more effectively, more thoroughly, so that we can look at advising uh, groups like Noxie on how to establish standards for youth, youth football. Nine to 14 year olds, they're starting to get their physical capacity. So they're running harder, they're faster. They are being coached. And I can guarantee in California or the other data set was coming out of North Carolina, they both know their football really, really, really well. And uh, they do, their coaches are very, very serious. Uh, and so when they start coaching kids, the kids learn the skills that they need to learn. And of course, as the kids mature, they've got more capacity and what we start to see a shift is to impact or tackling with the shoulder, so we see a lot more shoulder to head impacts. Head to ground, they start to get a little bit better control, they still are contacting ground, but we found that the impact velocities or impact energies when they hit the ground is not as high. They start to control and manage their head better, head helmet better. Oh, this is a little example of looking at a kid which is 66% of his profile is helmet. You look at a pro, 42% of their uh, profile is a helmet. And you can see with the little guy there, it's pretty hard to tackle somebody and not get your helmet involved. So in summary of this study, five to nine year olds experience high frequency with higher magnitude impacts compared to 9 to 14. And we think it's primarily because at this age, to play the game we're asking them to play, they just don't have the skill set to protect themselves or the level that they should have. Shoulder to head impacts, 5 to 9 year olds experience lower frequency and lower magnitudes of impacts compared to 9 to 14 year olds. 14 year olds are running around faster, harder, and they're being coached to hit. Head to ground impacts, 5 to 9 year olds experience the same percentage of impacts uh, but at a higher magnitude, and that's primarily because of controlling the large mass, and they have very small, uh, not particularly strong necks. So, 
Uh, that was our summary around football. And those of you who have been involved in young kids playing football, these are not surprising conclusions to you. However, these are the sort, this is the sort of information that I think is extremely valuable. So we can take our kids, give them the experience of football, which I think is fun, having done it myself, um, at a very, very low quality level, and, uh, and having that same experience. And I think that's, that's extremely important. So when we look at youth hockey, which I, is fairly well known, one part of this research that was kind of interesting to us is that, first of all, we found the very similar thing in youth hockey in that when you get down to IP and novice, um, you get a fairly high level of uh, impact um, uh, in terms, that there's a couple things that were interesting to us. One is that at little kids level, there were a lot of impacts, like a lot of impacts, but they're very, very low. In fact, they're again, one step away from hugging. And uh, the other thing is their damage or their injury comes from falling and hitting the ice with their head or falling and hitting the boards with their head. So that's where you created these high energy impacts. Uh, the other thing that I found rather not surprising but amusing is when the kids got up into the bantam midget, you're starting to see the game change. They're starting to play a more aggressive, more impact game, and you start to see the, the uh, trauma start to rocket up. And again, a lot of it's to do with they've got the capacity, but they haven't developed the, the real ways of protecting themselves. I remember, I think I spoke to this last year, that uh, one of the professional football players out of Hamilton came to the lab and we did a presentation and we're talking about it. And he says, you know, he played, I think, in Southern Cal on scholarship. He came out of Calgary, I think, or some uh, place like that. Anyhow, he says, well, now he's a big guy, obviously. He says, when I played high school ball, I just ran people over. I ran them down. I bulldozed them. He says, I got down to California. He said, I wasn't going to survive if I continued to try to do that because everybody on the field was my size, highly skilled. And when I went to pro, it even got worse. I had to know what I was doing because I knew I was going to be out there game after game. I got injured. I stopped getting paid. So he said, first thing I learned, get my hands in front of me. So you don't run, guys. You get your hands and you maneuver, guys. So I'm thinking, this is not really being taught to the kids uh, to how to protect yourself. And in pro hockey, they said the same thing. I remember when I was first involved, they said, well, how do you protect yourself? The guy said, get against the boards and get your elbow up and move the guy forward or back. You don't let him come in on you. And so these guys develop these skills of protection, and they know how to do it. And it's important that these athletes at 14 years old learn this before you let them start hitting. Because once you start hitting, as you all know, 12, 14, 15-year-old kids or boys are not particularly cognizant of protecting themselves, let's say, and they're running around like crazy people sometimes in a game, and you have to kind of reel that in, and that's not the easiest thing to do. So we also looked at, we separated out to, you know, how the level of concussions and event frequency impacts, and I think some of the things that we found that you have to separate it out as to impacts and not just concussions. Concussions are a good indicator. It's like a canary in a coal mine. They indicate something's wrong, but they don't give you the full story. So I think you'll have to start this again, Rob. And everybody who's had kids has watched this while your feet freeze and you're choking down some of the rink coffee. And this is what you watch. In fact, when we started this, these studies on kids, our uh, researchers were not happy because this is what they watched for hour on hour on hour. <laughs> they were begging somebody to hit somebody at some point. <laughs> so again, if you don't mind, so you'll watch this. And the, the type of injury you get, or there, you can see they run into each other. Oh, here we go. I think it might be here and fall down, and as you saw in the far there. Again, they, it's more they run into each other, they fall down, and when they fall, and it's funny because we were seeing stats, uh, injury data from, uh, from Hockey Canada, and we're seeing these little kids getting injured in what they said was collisions. So we're going, how could it be collisions? They're barely moving. And uh, what we found out was the collision precipitated the falling into the boards and falling onto the ice. So the person writing down, well, what happened? Well, they ran into each other. 
not recognizing that that's not where the trauma occurred. The trauma occurred when they fell down and hit their heads. And so the reason I think this is important to know, I know it's important to know, is because when coaches and when Hockey Canada and want to make this game safer for the kids, the biggest number of kids at the lowest levels, if they want to make it safer, they want, may want to do something about how the kids interact, how they go and jab at the puck when they're at the other player's feet. Because when you jab at the puck on a kid that can barely skate, you hit his skates, he falls over. He falls over, he hits his head on the ice, he hits his head on the boards and gets a concussion or gets uh, head trauma. So these are the cues or the clues that can make this game safer. And I know when we talk to uh, coaches, we talk to Hockey Canada and all these, they don't want to change the game. So they say, well, we can't do that, it's not hockey. Uh, yes, it is. The games have been changed every year for years and years and years. Um, just watching hockey today, it's changed for the better. And so we, ha I the people in this room take control of this game at that level. And that will help, and I know you guys are doing it, but it helps us enormously. Again, please. Boom. And they both fall down. But this is the sort of thing that we see. And, and, and be honest, up at this age level, kids are not trying to hurt each other. This is not their intent. We coach them to play the game differently. And so we can, the influence of the coach is extremely important on how the game will be played. Poof. Down they go. And like I say to us, there is no surprise there to anybody because we know this is exactly what happens. Uh, is, here we go. And so as they get older, you can see kids get more intent. And this wasn't a, a, a horrible impact. The guy just squashed them out into the boards, and that's, you know, the game. So we can look at ways, and the reason uh, I, I repeat the people in the game have to take ownership on this is because we know that if you do, we'll have a good game in the end. Okay, I'll move on. So head contact changes with age and competition levels. We have to be cognizant of that. The changes we make at the pro level, the changes we make at the uh, high school level will not be appropriate for kids who are starting the game. We need to modify the game according to their age, the gender to some degree, and to the competition level. A lot of non-body checking and head contact occurs from accidental impacts. Things that are just plain accident. It's not a penalty. It's an accident. And we have to think of how do we control accidental impacts, especially for the young kids. Because that's what's happening. As you see here, these kids are accidentally running into each other. They're poking at the, the pocket on their stick or skates. And that's what we need to manage. We can't just think of it in terms of pro hockey where you give penalties uh, for bad behavior. Or, or, and then when they say the guy gets drilled and somebody says, ah, it's not a penalty. That's beside the point. And it's even further beside the point with children. Once you start body checking, the mechanism for uh, trauma is primarily delivering and receiving a uh, uh, body check. We know that. We document it. As you get up, it becomes even more so. Main point of contact is head to boards glass as a result of instrumental play and giving and receiving a body check. That's really what we found as you go up to high skill level is that they're not falling and hitting their head because they can control their head. In fact, in the NFL, or sorry, the NHL, uh, that's less than 3% of head impacts are to the ice. It's primarily because the athletes know where they are in the ice unless they get jammed like last night and get flipped upside down and dropped on your head, you typically don't hit your head to the ice. What we found is because of the way the game's played today is they're getting run into the glass. So head to glass, head to board, but primary head to glass is where we're seeing a lot of trauma, repetitive trauma. Overall, injuries are low and non-severe with the majority of players returning to play the following game. This is in youth hockey. And we're very pleased to say that because we think, as all of us here, that sport's great and it's great in the kid's life. And if we can just manage that even better, it's clearly something we can do. IP and novice have higher head contact than expected. Uh, lots of head contact, lots at a very low magnitude. But there is no reason we can't 
change the game slightly, modify the rules slightly, and decrease the risk of accidental head impacts to the ice and boards. Again, the initial contact is really what's creating this fall to the ice and into the boards. We just have to manage the initial contact. Youth 9 to 13 experience a high frequency of low energy collision impact. So we're going to measure, we're going, you're going to want to manage frequency with this age group. Risk for concussion in youth is primarily falls to the ice and boards. Adolescents 4 to 17 years old experience increased frequency and high energy collisions as they move into more contact. Hockey is played differently for age groups and competition levels. I believe I've already said that. However, we would modify the rules and the protective equipment specific to age levels and competition levels, and it would be more effective. So, summary, brain trauma in sport. Helmets are primarily designed to mitigate the risk of traumatic brain injury. It does help concussions, no mistake, but this is why they were designed. And they're very effective at it, by the way, thankfully. I would estimate, and this is an estimate, that less than 50% of concussions are reported for a variety of reasons, and you've heard them all here. I think education is important and it's helping with this, but let's not be naive. Sport and tooth brain trauma is not just defined by concussion. I know I've been saying this for a number of years, but as we continue to have better methods of looking at changes in brain tissue, it confirms that this is a bigger issue than just concussion. Brain trauma can be described by magnitude, frequency, interval, and duration of exposure. We feel this can really capture the trauma, especially when we're looking at brain tissue strains. Brain trauma is specific to the sport, age, competition level, and rules and protective equipment need to reflect these differences. So, I'm gonna go on a limb here. Future in youth sport, and I know you've heard this many, many times, but no contact, no hitting sport 14 years and younger. I do not think this is a challenge. I think we need to do this. Young players have less emotional control. They do not have the cognitive or the physical skills to protect themselves effectively. Head trauma in children, children have a, has a long-lasting effect on their lives. They drop, and you know this, they drop out of school or lose a year in grade six, seven, eight, nine. They lose a year there. Their risk for dropping out of school goes up dramatically. We do not fully understand the effect, the effect of head trauma on children's brains. We do not. We know we're learning a lot, but we don't know the full effect. That makes us, we have to be cautious under those conditions. Okay, this is a tough one. No contact or hitting sport in academic institutions. I know it's going to be controversial. Head injuries resulting in, from contact sport is contradictory to what our institutions are responsible for. Mental health and education. So we're talking about middle school, high school, and universities. Included universities. There has to be severe penalties for intentional head impacts. And I don't mean kicking a kid out of the school, because, and I, you've heard me say this many times, the child is the, lowest, is the lowest guy in the totem pole for control on the ice. Parent, coach, and I'll say coach over and over again, have to be held accountable. The leagues, the institutions have to be held accountable. They need to modify the game so we don't put the child in a position where they're making decisions on risk. So we're looking at the coach, the team, and the player. As we all know, there are players that need to take responsibility. So we have to include all of them. We also have to increase rules for accidental or incidental head impacts. We, we ignore it because we always think, oh, let's change the rules because we look at the pros all the time. But a lot of head impacts are incidental, they're accidental. We can manage that better. And in a lot of cases we have, like no hitting from behind, no contacting body youth hockey 10 years, 
all, there's all kinds of rules we can make uh, and make, maintain the integrity of the game and make it safer. Rigorous monitoring the enforcement of the rules. We need to support the referees, even though they may be the high school kid who's making 25 or 50 bucks a game. We have to make sure we respect them, the players respect them, the league respects them, and so they can enforce the rules. And I know this group, I'm talking to the converted. Thank you very much. We have a couple minutes for questions, do we? Or are you going to throw me off the stage again? <laughs> uh, question over here on your left. I was just wondering, um, Hockey Canada is pushing like uh, smaller ice hockey now for the kind of the IP and younger ages. Um, have you guys looked at any of those studies from what you're looking at just for accidental head contact? Is it increasing with the smaller ice? Like, I believe like... Like, it's a good idea to have a smaller ice, more touches on the puck and things like that for development. But it, has it caused more accidental head contact just because they're playing in a smaller area? That, that's, I, yeah, I understand. I, we were talking about this actually at our last meeting. Uh, what he's referring to is a smaller ice surface where you, I think you break the ice into three pieces or something. Yeah. yeah. And we used to do that in the olden days because we never really had enough ice. Um, so the question becomes, is that safer? And that is a very good question. Because typically what we found with kids was a fact that as they interacted more, in other words, the more they were jabbing at each other's uh, skates, more the kids fell down. So as you drop down the ice surface, you're going to get more interactions, so you have to put in some way of managing that. So you are correct that very likely this will increase the amount of trauma. We have not studied it. We've not been given that mandate, but it would certainly be likely. And the, qu the reason is it's not so much that they're running each other, they're like put in a, a cage match. What it is is they're going to be chasing the pucks and knocking the kids over accidentally. And that results in kids hitting their heads to boards or to the ice, and that's what creates trauma with these little guys. So yes, I would suggest this may increase the risk. So, um, uh, compliant boards is what you're talking about, uh, and we do study them in the uh, pros because there's been an ongoing discussion around uh, putting some uh, release on the boards. And anybody who's played in those old rinks where it's, uh, uh, the boards are up against concrete has felt that being thrown into the boards and hitting the concrete, not a pleasant feeling. Uh, quite frankly, for helping the shoulders and so forth, um, yeah, that helps. The brain, not so much, primarily because it's the mass of the boards. And the easy thing to do for kids is use the foam that they use for speed skating, indoor or uh, short, short course speed skating. The, you know, those things are, like, this is what I'm saying. I, I just thought of this a minute because we also looked at uh, how uh, speed skaters get trauma, head trauma. But that, that's an easy fix, because most of the kids aren't, you know, putting it off the glass out of zone. That's not their skill set. They're just running around. And so if you can re replace the boards with these foam partitioners, they fall in and nothing's going to happen. And so these are the things, these are the easy fixes. Hello, uh, Pierre Blanchard, a hockey referee, coach, and wannabe player. Uh, <laughs> Join the club. <laughs> Apparently, when I was first asked to come here and saw Cassie Campbell on the uh, diet, I thought we were invited to talk about our hockey careers. <laughs> Mine being about a one-minute speech. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I'm seeing a lot of your studies are uh, most probably under a controlled age group and playing levels. Considering that Offsa Hockey right now has five different age groups, and up to five different playing levels playing at once. Uh, 
would that be consideration for a study or what would be your opinions on the results that would come out of uh, such a situation as that? Yeah, I, I th what's interesting when we look at the different age groups is that in part, one of the things we found which was quite fascinating for us, I think it was a bantam level. We had a team in Quebec just across the border in Gatineau and we had a, a series of teams there and some in Ontario. And the, the league that we had in Gatineau had a different set of rules for body, Im, uh, Im, or sorry, body checking in the mid zone. And I, I, to be honest, can't remember exact detail. But we didn't know this when we first got the data. And all of a sudden we're saying, why is the trauma lower for the Quebec teams? And then we went back and talked to the, the people collecting the data, and they said, well, the rules are different. And so first of all, we're happy because our tool picked this up, so it was sensitive. And the second thing was uh, rules matter. This is at the bantam level. So what I think what we see, to answer your question, I guess if I ever get there, is that there is a real bleed over in terms of age. So I don't know if it's, you know, how precise we can be, because a lot of it does, a lot of it's related to the, the ability of the player. And uh, the second piece is how competitive competitive is. Because a lot of times you have five competitive levels just to break out the kids and you got so many kids, you, you separate them out. Um, and whether they're in B or A, I know to coaches it matters, but probably for trauma less so. But I, we haven't looked at that clearly. Yeah, I mean, these are the strategies, like I say, understanding that and understanding how trauma occurs, this information to you becomes valuable. To me, I'm just talking to people. But to people who do it, they understand it differently, you make a change, and that matters. Yeah. I thought that was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Blaine. I, I honestly thought that was a fantastic presentation. Not that the last six years were that bad, but this was exceptional. I wish Warren would have been here to hear that. Um, I got one quick announcement to make. Uh, we had many requests yesterday from a copy of the book called Oliver's, Oliver the Owl. <laughs> Oliver's Big Bump. Yes, they wrote Oliver or the Oliver. Uh, why? That Eric Lindros, referred, there's 150 copies at the, at the desk, and that's all we have. If you take one each, there won't be enough, but God bless you, the ones that get there first. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back here in 15 minutes and hear Cassie Campbell. <laughs> 